Hey, everybody. Welcome home, everybody. Come on. I am, I am so happy to see your faces. I just want to look at y'all just for a second. Y'all looking good. Y'all smell good. You look good. Oh, my goodness. You have no idea. I love, 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 love. I love you. And I'm so glad that we're back together again. And I just really believe that as we continue to move forward, we're going to see things continue to grow around here as, as the, the comfort level continues to increase. And so, man, so thankful that you guys are here today. And I want to take a second and say a big hello to our church online family. And I want you to know this, that as the pastor, you're never going to feel pressure from me. Instead, I want you to be able to return at your own comfort and at your own pace, okay? You just need to know that, all right? And uh, you would need to know that we are actually in the process right now of upgrading all kinds of technology here on the campus so as to give you the very best church online experience. And here's what we know. We are one church that just so happens to be meeting in many different rooms, all right? And so even though your room may be different than our room, I'm thankful that we are one church together and we serve our mighty great Lord Jesus Christ. And so I'm just so thankful that you're here. And I wanna say a big hello to all of the men and women in two of our Texas Department of Corrections, both in Bonham and in Collin County. Come on, Life Fellowship, would you give them the biggest welcome that you possibly can give? We're glad that you've joined with us in service. And hey, if you're joining with us for the very first time, let me give you my welcome. I am I'm beyond delighted that you've chose to join with us today in service. And you couldn't pick a better day because we are in week number one of a five-part series entitled Legends of the Faith. I'll tell you more about that here in just one second. But I just want to tell you that this message, really this series, has the potential to absolutely change your life. And so let's go right into the theme verse for this series. And if you'd like, you can follow along today with your message notes that are available on your Life Fellowship app. Okay, that's a free app that you can download. And here's the theme verse, and it says this. Therefore, so time out. Anytime you see the word therefore, you need to find out what it's there for, all right? Uh, <laughs> And uh, what it's there for is it's referring to the previous chapter, chapter 11, that has been nicknamed the Great Hall of Fame of Faith. And in that chapter, it, it talks about some of the great legends like Moses and Noah and, and Abraham. And so we, we see how they did great exploits through their faith in God. And so it goes on, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, meaning those that have already been invested into heaven are actually watching you. In fact, they're, they're in, in essence kind of uh, leaning over the banister of heaven and they got their pom-poms in hand and they're cheering you on as you run your, your, your life race, okay? So let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. So in other words, uh, let's pay careful attention to how they ran their race so that you and I, we can win like they won. All right? And so, therefore, let us run. Come on, everybody. Run, Forrest, run. <laughs> With perseverance, the race. God has a race marked out for you and for you and for you and for me. And it's all, it's all unique. He's got that for all of us. And so the big idea of this series is this, that every single week we're going to take one of these great legends of the faith, both men and women, over these next five weeks, and we just kind of imagine, what would it be like if they could step out of heaven and come run one lap around the track of life with you? What would they say? How would they encourage you? And I think that you're going to discover two things are going to happen in this series. And the first is, is that you will be greatly encouraged by what they have to say. And the second thing is that you're going to learn your Bible. You're going to learn things that maybe you never even learned before because I'm going to hopefully pull out things about each of these characters that maybe you have never realized on the surface level. And so today, we're pulling out of the grandstands of heaven, Abraham. And Abraham, both in the Old Testament and New Testament, is called the father of faith. So today, we're going to study three different stories that come out of his life. 
And he's really going to encourage us to increase our level of faith and trust in God. In fact, that word faith, can we not agree? That's kind of a a biblical word, a Bible word that can sometimes be a little bit confusing, okay? So let me break it down as simple as I possibly can. It really basically means this. Faith is the ability to trust. And trust isn't needed until you don't understand. And so I, I dedicate this message today to every person that is here that you're either going through or you've been through things And you've asked the question, God, I don't get this. I don't understand why all this stuff is is happening. And honestly, isn't that every single one of us here recently what's happened in our world right now? And if Abraham could step out of the grandstands of heaven and come stand on this platform, I think that he would speak to every person that is going through difficulty here. And he would say these words to you, that God always does the right thing. Come on, everyone, say these words after me. God always does the right thing. He always does. And the reason why I need to teach you this is because there's a lot of us that we have this potential on the inside of us to think that, God, you're actually doing the wrong thing. God, this situation in my life, you missed the mark here. You're actually doing the wrong thing. And I'm here to tell you that God always does the right thing. And that's where trust is able to take you. It's able to take you to the place that you're saying, I'm okay with not knowing now. In fact, let me illustrate this for you. Um, when, when my kids were a lot younger, I remember one time Blakely came to us and she said, Dad, 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 can, can I please go spend the night at Kelly's house? And so I talked to Tatum and we came back to her and we said, we're sorry, sweetie. But the answer is no. But why, Dad? Because we don't know Kelly's parents. We don't know their values. We don't know their faith. We don't know what they do. We don't know what they watch. We don't know how they behave in the house. And on top of all that, we don't know anything about their 17-year-old son that is there in that house. So I'm sorry, but the answer is no. But daddy, (laughs) daddy, there's other girls that are going over the house. I'm so sorry, honey. I know you don't get this right now. But there's actually going to come a day that you're going to come to me and you're going to say, Daddy, I understand why you did that. Thank you so much for protecting me. But right now, you just don't understand. You don't get it. And I think that trust has the ability to say, God, I'm okay with not knowing. Even if not knowing means not knowing until I get to heaven. In fact, how many of you have ever heard of ponderables? Any, any of y'all? I, I thought I'd have some fun with you guys today, so I, I brought a couple of them with me. I, I think these are hilarious, so let me just read some to you, all right? Ponderables. Have, have you ever wondered if Adam and Eve had a belly button, huh? Come on, somebody. Don't you, like, dude, you got one or no, huh? <laughs> I, I want to find out. <laughs> have you ever wondered why women can't put on mascara with their mouths closed? <laughs> Have you noticed that? I think that's funny. Have you ever wondered why abbreviated is such a long word? (laughs) Have you ever wondered why the man who invests your money is called a broker? (laughs) Have you ever wondered why, if flying is so safe, why do they call airports a terminal? Come on, everybody. That's funny. (laughs) I don't care what you say. That's funny. That's funny. So have you ever had moments that God just didn't make sense to you? I mean, think about that moment right now. Think about it in your your heart, about that moment. And I I really believe that if, if Abraham could step out of the grandstands of heaven, he would come run alongside of us and he'd begin to talk to us about his life. And so that's what I want to do today. I want to study three different stories out of Abraham's life, and we're going to We're going to mine some truths that are going to be very applicable to where we're at right now in culture. And I want to begin by taking you to Genesis chapter 15. And so follow along. Here's what it says. After this, the word of the Lord came to Abraham in a vision. Now, God's showing up in Abraham's life because he's really discouraged. And the reason why he is so discouraged is because God had promised that he would be the father of many nations. And he doesn't even have any kids at this point right now. None. And so God shows up, and look at what he says. This is so important. Don't be afraid. 
And I think that for a lot of us in our culture right now, this is the word of the Lord for you. Don't be afraid, Abraham. I am your shield and your very great reward. But Abraham responded. He fired back, sovereign Lord. What can you give me since I remain childless? In other words, God, you're making a bunch of promises to me that you're not keeping, holding up your end of the bargain. And the one who will inherit my estate is Eliezer of Damascus, which was his servant, which was basically like his chief of staff. Okay? So Abraham said this. He goes on. You have given me no children, so a servant in my household will be my heir. Like, God, really? Really, this is your plan all along? Come on, God! What's up with this? Then the word of the Lord came to him. This man will not be your heir, but a son who is your own flesh and your blood will be your heir. God was saying, I know it looks like it's impossible, Abraham, but I need you to believe the impossible. And then notice what God does next. He took him outside. So time out. Let me push pause in this story right now. Because God's got a dilemma. And here's his dilemma. Uh, you and I don't see things like God sees things. We have a very limited perspective. We see through uh, temporal lenses. God sees the beginning and the end. He knows everything at the same time. And us, isn't it true? Sometimes it's hard to even know what to do the next hour or two hours or day, let alone five years from now. And so anytime that God wants to try to do something new in your life, oftentimes he will try to show you what he's about to do. But what do you do when God shows you and you don't understand? That you come to the conclusion, God, you're wrong. God, this is not right. God, you're making a massive mistake on this thing right here. What do you do when God doesn't make sense? These are the moments that you have to lean in and trust God based on your faith. And that's where I... Abraham was. So God was trying to help him to understand, <clears throat> and he didn't understand. And so God said, hey, look up at the sky and count the stars. And if indeed you can count them, then he said to them, so shall your offspring be. And I truly believe that at this point, Abraham still had no idea what God was talking about right here. I, I still don't think that he understood. And so now Abraham has lived his life. He has ran his race. He has climbed up into heaven. And I think that if he could come back down and run one lap with you around the track of life, I think the very first thing that he would tell every single one of us is this. Number one, God always takes, does the right thing, even if it takes a long time. He'd tell you, man, I thought God was going to give me a kid when my reproductive ability was intact. I had no idea God would wait until it wasn't in working. He'd say, man, take it from me. God takes a long time. And that's the exact same statement that the two sisters would say to you when Jesus showed up late to the party when Lazarus had died. Because they came to Jesus and said, Jesus, <laughs> you're late. And Lazarus is four days dead. He is four days dead. You've missed your opportunity. And hey, everybody, we all know how that story all played out. No, no. God is going to seem like he takes a long time, but God always does the right thing. In fact, in this message today, I need to give you some, some truths that you're not necessarily going to enjoy. You're not going to actually even like these, but you need to hear them. And here's the first one, and that's this, that God is notorious for taking a long time. At least in your mind, it's a long time. And so let me take you to the actual story that we find this taking place in the book of Genesis, and kind of let me just set this up for you. So Abraham had no kids, and so Sarah said, I've devised a plan to get us to have some kids. So Abraham, I want to give you my slave, my handmaiden, and I want you to, to, to sleep with her, and maybe just maybe God will give us a child that way. Utter desperation. So here's what the, the Bible says. Now, Sarai, Abram's wife, which is, this is what their names were before God changed their names to Abraham and Sarah, had borne him no children, but she had an Egyptian slave named Hagar, 
So she said to Abram, the Lord has kept me from having children. So go sleep with my slave. Perhaps I can build a family through her. So in other words, God's not doing it in, in, I think God's taking way too long. So let's do things according to my plan and how quickly I want to see things done. And Abraham agreed to what Sarah said. And that decision right there was an absolutely dangerous decision. Because Ishmael was born, who today is called the father of the Arab nations. And all kinds of problems have happened because Abraham had no patience. Everybody, you need to know this, that God is a patient God. In fact, check this out. Our timing and God's timing are rarely ever the same. Like, we like things done now. We want things done with instant, we want it done. I mean, that's why we have microwaves and DoorDash and, and drive throughs and ATMs. I want, I want it now. I, I want it now. I want it to happen right now. In fact, <laughs> let me tell you a funny joke. Uh, this, I don't know if you guys heard about the guy that was questioning God. And he came to God one day and he said, hey, God. How much is a million dollars to you? And God responded back and said, it's like a, it's like a penny. He said, well, God, I, like, how much is a million years to you? And God said, man, it's like a second. The guy said, well, God, can I have one of those pennies? <laughs> and God said, in just one second. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, everybody. That was funnier than that. <laughs> Come on, those of you online, if you think that's funny, come on, give me a smiley face right now. Come on. That's, but it's okay. The Bible says that laughter is good medicine for the soul, huh? All right, so check this verse out. Second Peter says, the Lord is not slow in keeping his promise as some understand slowness. So you think that he's slow, but he's not. God's patient. God is patient. And, and, and we've got to know that. In fact, I got some more bad news for you today. God is dead set on uh, working this character of patience inside of all of his kids. That's why one of the fruit of the Spirit is called patience. Patience. And some of you are thinking, man, I will do without that gift in my life. I don't want that fruit at all. Well, I got bad news for you. God is dead set on making sure that every one of his kids, that's you and me, have this character of patience working on the inside of us, all right? Here's the second thing that Abraham would tell you today if he could run along the lap of the track of life with you, and that's this. God will always do the right thing, even if it seems absurd. So you're going to have moments with God, you're going to say, God, you're out of your mind. You're crazy. You're, you're loco. There's just no way. You are absurd. In fact, here's the story. You guys know it. Uh, Abraham is, he is 99. Sarah is 89. And God shows up and says, I know that you two lovebirds don't have any kids yet, but you're about to have a baby. And so here's the story. It plays out here in Genesis. And it says, then, then one of them, this is speaking of the Trinity, God said to them, I will surely return to you about this time next year, and Sarah, your wife, will have a son. And Sarah was listening at the entrance to the tent, which was behind him, and Abraham and Sarah were very old, 99 and 89. And Sarah was past the age of childbearing. So time out. Ladies, think about you. Imagine, imagine being 89 years of age, and you walking into all your friends saying, hey, ladies, guess what? <laughs> I'm pregnant. <laughs> yeah, that, Everyone would do the same thing. They wouldn't say anything. All right, let's, let's keep going there. So Sarah, she laughed. Now, you're going to find this out later on, but God took great offense to her laughing at what the Lord said. Because God was looking at her saying, really? Really, you don't think that I'm able to do what I said that I can do? She laughed to herself and thought, after I am worn out, my Lord is old, will I now have this pleasure? Then the Lord said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh and say, will I really have a child now that I am old? Notice this, is there anything too hard for the Lord? And there are those of us that we need to be reminded of this today. For some of us, that's the word of the Lord for you today. Nothing is too hard for your God. And I will return to you, notice this, 
at the appointed time. At the appointed time. You know, I remember when Tatum's granddad passed away. I remember after the funeral was done uh, in, in our living room at, at the home, it was just Tatum and I, and uh, I, I remember just holding her. She just, I mean, she just cried and she cried and she cried. You have no idea how important and how valuable, how much he meant to her. I mean, she was hurting pretty bad. But both of us were encouraged with the reality that this was his appointed time. Appointed time. You have an appointed time. I have an appointed time. And I listen, I'm 44 years old right now. I don't know if my appointed time is 44 or 144, but I'm going to tell you, corona or no corona, my God is the one that controls my life. My life is in God's hands. Can I remind you of that? My life is in, I have an appointed time, and nothing will make that go quicker unless God says it should go quicker. I have an appointed time, and you do too. At the appointed time, and Sarah will have a son. I'm telling you, everybody, you're going to have moments you think, God, why are you taking so long? God, you are out of your mind. This is absurd. But you're going to need to know this, that God always does the right thing. Here's the third thing. Abraham would say, God always does the right thing, even when we don't understand. So again, you know this story. God says to Abraham, I'm going to test you. The greatest test that Abraham ever faced. He said, I want to see. Out of the blue, he told Abraham, I want you to sacrifice your one and only son, Isaac, to me. Because I want to see, do you love me as much as the heathens love their gods? Because in the country where Abraham lived, the heathens would sacrifice their children to the demon gods. And so God was saying to Abraham, hey, hey, bub, I want to see, do you love me as much as all of the heathens love their gods? Now, what's so interesting is that this is the first time ever in Abraham's life that he doesn't push back. In fact, he doesn't argue. He doesn't say a thing. Instead, he just starts picking up all the firewood. He, he goes and he grabs the knife, takes his son. He doesn't complain. He doesn't argue. He doesn't say a single thing. Not a single thing. Why? Because Abraham had gotten to the place where he completely trusted God. And that's the level that I'm trying to bring every single one of us to today in this place. Because here's what I need you to know. that The, the longer that you serve God, you're going to have moments. You're going to have times that you're going to think, God, you're making a mistake here. And come to find out, he was right. You're going, to go through, you're going to go through moments and seasons and things that you're going to think, God, that's, that's the wrong move. And come to find out at the end of it all, that was the right move. See, the longer that you walk with God, you're going to be more and more convinced that, you know what, it might seem like it's taken a long time. It might seem like it's absurd. It might be something that I don't necessarily understand in my brain, but God, you did the right thing. You did the right thing. In fact, I want to show you this story, not out of the Genesis account. I want to show it to you out of the Hebrews account, and the reason for that is because it gives us an extra added detail. Check it out. Hebrews says this, by faith, Abraham when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. So they were climbing this mountain called Mount Moriah. Abraham was going to the top to sacrifice his son Isaac, which, interesting enough, this is today in modern-day Jerusalem. In fact, the very spot where they believed that Abraham was about to sacrifice his son is where the Muslims now occupy, and they have built what's called the Dome on the Rock. You've seen that where the temple is at. It's that golden uh, dome that's there. Underneath that is where they believed that Abraham was at where he, where he was about to sacrifice his son. I've been there. Some of you else have been there with us. And I'd love for you to come back, join with us in the days to come when we can go see this. And it was at that place that God stopped him right before he was about to slam the knife through his son's heart. And God said, hey, 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 I never intended for you to kill your own son. Instead, I was testing your heart. I want you to look over there in the bushes. There's a ram. Sacrifice that instead. 
He who had embraced the promises was about to sacrifice his one and only son. Even though, even though God had said to him, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. Now here's that detail. Abraham reasoned that God could even raise his son from the dead. Abraham believed this, that even though he would sacrifice his son, his son would jump right back up. Come on, everybody. That is faith. I'm not there yet. I know you're not there yet. To which you ask the question today, how do you get to a place like that? Watch this. The more that you know him, the more that you trust him. Hey, everybody, God knows best. The Bible says in Psalms, it says in chapter 9, verse 10, those who know the Lord, trust him. I'm convinced that one of the most embarrassing moments in eternity is going to be when people are going to step into heaven convinced that God did the wrong thing. And God's going to pull back the veil. He's going to say, this is why I did what I did. And I think that every person that is going to see behind this veil is going to say, oh, that's why you did that. That, that, makes, that makes sense. God, you were right. How many of y'all know I am so thankful that God did not answer a number of prayers in my own life? There were a lot of girls growing up. I thought, man, I could marry that girl. I prayed about it. And I'm thankful that God did not answer my prayer because I've looked some of them up on Facebook and all I can say is praise God. <laughs> praise God for that. <laughs> <laughs> mm. <laughs> Come on, everybody. L look at this. Say this out loud with me. God knows best. Come on, say it again. God knows best. Can I ask you to give up on the quest of always trying to have to understand everything and instead go on a journey to try to know God more? Listen, I'm not saying I don't want you to learn and grow and understand things, but if you make understanding the prerequisite for every act of obedience, then you've just reduced God down to the size of your brain. He's bigger than that. And so here's Abraham. And I, I, I think that Abraham would come alongside you today and he would, he would want to encourage you with this last final thought before he would find himself heading back up into the grandstands of heaven. In fact, think about this. Anybody that has ran their race and they have now been invested into heaven, I think that they have perspective just like Abraham has perspective because he's finished his race. And with that perspective, I think that they would look at anybody that is going through tough times, questions, difficulty, unanswered prayers, and they would look you in the eyes, whoever that is, and they would say, it's not what you think it is. And they would start talking to you about perspective. Perspective. They would help you to understand that it's not really what you think that it is. In fact, um, as a pastor, I've been in ministry now for 22 years. And in 22 years, I have uh, I've done a lot of funerals, a lot of them. Uh, I've, I've been with people in the absolute toughest moments that you can possibly imagine, absolute most, the most tragic. And uh, here's what I know. It, it seems like when things happen suddenly, it, it even hurts more. And even the younger that they are, the more pain that it has associated to it. And there's, there's almost this expectation on guys like me to have to say the right thing at the right moment. And after 22 years of ministry, here's what I've come to the conclusion. There are no perfect words to say to make the pain completely go away. And so what I do in moments like that is I do one thing, and that is where I point people to heaven, I, I, I try to refocus them because I think it's so interesting that the last thought that the Bible gives about Abraham's life is about one key thought, and it's all about 
heaven. See, everybody, here's what you need to know today. Our hope is not in a better earth. Our hope is in heaven. Have you yet discovered it that earth will mess you up? Earth stinks. You want to stay here? Have fun. Not me. Earth will let you down. If you got all your eggs planted in the basket of this place called earth, you're setting yourself up for a world of disappointment. Listen, listen, listen. Please listen to me. Look at my eyes. Ah, I hope earth works out for you. Sometimes it does. Most times it doesn't. That's why I'm not looking to a, a better earth. I'm looking to one glad morning when this life is over. Come on, everybody. I'm bouncing. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be with Jesus for forever. And I think that if Abraham was standing on this platform right here, he would want to grab you by the shoulders. He would look you in the eyes. And he would make this statement to you. He would say, don't you dare make earth your home. Don't plant your roots so deep down into this place because if all of your satisfaction and your enjoyment and your contentment comes from this place called earth, you are, you are living way beneath the potential. See, that's why Paul, he constantly kept, he kept making this statement over and over. He said, I'm an alien and a stranger here on this planet. This ain't my home. I'm just passing through. He said, I'm not a citizen of earth. I'm a citizen of heaven. Paul kept his eyes on Jesus. And that's why the very last reference to the father of faith in your Bible says this. Watch this. By faith... Abraham made his home in the promised land like a stranger, an alien, a foreigner in a country. He lived in tents. In other words, he, he didn't even set up permanent residence. For he was, come on everybody, he was looking forward, he was looking ahead. Don't plant your roots so deep down in this place called earth. Look ahead to the city whose foundations, whose architect and builder is God. And I'm going to tell you, God don't build no tents. He builds mansions, baby. Beautiful mansions. My eyes are on heaven. God's got a mansion for me. He, heaven is my home. And, I, and you need to make sure that heaven is your home. In fact, I close today with this, this life motto of mine. And I pray maybe it'll become yours. This was instilled to me from my mom and my dad. And it's this, only one life will soon be passed. It's quicker than you think, everybody. James says it's like a mist and a vapor. It's gone. The only thing that's gonna matter is what you've done for the kingdom, what you've done for Christ. Only that what's done for Christ will last. Amen, everybody. I want you to see this one more time. God always does the right thing. He always does. Come on, right where you're at, would you bow your heads, and close your eyes? Lord, today we, we tell you that we're, we're resigning the quest of trying to have to understand it all. And instead, Lord, we make a new goal, and that is to know you more. Because those that know you trust you. And so, Lord, I just pray right now for every person that's here today, regardless of whatever it is that they're walking through, those that are joining us online. Holy Spirit, touch our hearts, I pray. Touch our hearts, I pray. Father, drill that truth so deep down on the inside of us. Because we're dust, we forget it. We forget, Lord, sometimes that you do always do the right thing, that you, that you know the beginning from the end. You know the very numbers of hairs on our head. So come on, right where you're at. Come on, right where you're at. Would you just, come on, take a, just lean back into him. 
Just whisper these words underneath your breath. Just say, Lord, I trust you. Come on, think of the worst situation you could be in right now. And just whisper it to him, God, I trust you. I trust that you always do the right thing. So with heads bowed and eyes closed, maybe you're here and you're away from God. God wants to touch you. He wants to change you. And it's time that you surrender your life to him. Heaven needs to be your home, I'm telling you. If your hope is in earth, <laughs> you're going to be massively disappointed. There's only one name by where we may be saved. One name, one path. His name is Jesus. And he said, everybody who calls on my name, everybody will be saved. And if you're saying, I want to open my heart to him, right where you're at, I want you to just whisper these words underneath your breath. Just say, Lord Jesus, I give you my life. <laughs> I give you my, my failures, my sin, my junk. Change me. Save me. Thank you for hearing my prayer today. In Jesus' mighty name, I ask. And all God's people, come on, said amen. Amen.